This is Gareth Aiden, and I'm here today on behalf of the National Bar Association and its historical committee to take the oral history of one of the uh, preeminent trial lawyers of my generation, Bob Walker. Bob, thanks mm. for coming. Well, thanks for asking me. Um, let's begin sort of formally. Could you tell us your full name and your birth date? Yeah. Robert J. Walker, Robert Jackson Walker. Uh, born September 5th, 1940. And were you born in Monterey? Monterey, Tennessee. Uh, my mother was from Jackson County. Her father was Jackson. So they named me Robert Jackson after her father. Very good. What about, um, tell us a little bit about your mom and dad, where they'd grown up and uh, what Well, mom did. was born in Gainesboro, 1908. Mm -hmm. Stayed there until she was probably 12, and uh, when Gainsborough kind of began, her daddy was a, a soft goods salesman, had a dry goods store. And Gainsborough began to go on the wane when the railroad became more important than the river. So they moved to Cookville. And so she grew up in Cookville, Tennessee. My dad was born and raised in Monterey, grew up there, uh, went to school there. He did come down to Nashville and live with his sister and actually did his senior year high school year and graduated from Montgomery Bell Academy. How about that? Rode a streetcar out there and went to school his senior year. And there's a picture of him in the graduating class at 23. He was the captain of their basketball team, five feet six. What was your, what was your dad's business while you were growing lumber. up? Lumber. He was in the lumber business with his older brother and they manufactured hardwood flooring out of so, old Kickery Maple. Did their business include harvesting the lumber or was it working with it to prepare it for market? No, they did it all. They uh, had timber, go out and buy standing timber, mm -hmm. had a sawmill or two, cut the timber, bring it in, saw the logs, stack the lumber, age it on the yard, then run it through a series of milling machines till they made the hardwood flooring, tongue and groove hardwood flooring. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I don't know when they started that, probably, ooh, my uncle probably started about 1915 and my dad came in there probably in 25. Is the business still operating? No. Uh, my brother and I bought it from our dad, who got it from his older brother, and then we, we bought our dad out. And then when I got out of the Navy and spent a year or two working there, I sold my interest to my brother. and went to law school and he kept it another year and then sold it to the E.L. Bruce Company, which was a big manufacturer in Memphis. And Did they opened it for a little while and then closed it. Right. What was your brother's name? James E. Walker, Jr., Jim Walker. Did you have any other brothers or sisters? No, just two of us. And he was almost 10 years older than I am. Yeah. He passed away in December of 15, just recently, Christmas Eve right. at 86. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you went to elementary school. Well, I grew up in Monterey. My father was working for my uncle, and they had a falling out, I learned later, when I was about six. So dad left, we moved to Franklin, Tennessee, because you couldn't get a home in Nashville because of the post-war surge of people moving in. There just wasn't anything available. Mm -hmm. Lived in Franklin, and he got a job with one of his distant relatives closing out a stave and heading business, which was the old business that made wooden barrels, right. staves and heading. And after, so I went to the first grade in Franklin, Tennessee, right there at Five Points. And uh, after the summer after my first grade year, uh, my mom told me we were going out to get some dinner and Uncle Hubert is coming down to meet with Dad. We're gonna see what happens. So they came down to reconcile and we moved back to Monterey. So I went to the second through the eighth grade there at Monterey Elementary School. And I think something pretty important happened about that time after you got through with the eighth grade. Did you oh, yeah. go somewhere? After new? the eighth grade, I went to Macaulay School in Chattanooga, Tennessee as a boarding student mm -hmm. in the ninth grade. And I did four years at Macaulay. Finished in 1958. 
Did State you, of Vanderbilt. Did you go there with anyone that you still see or know here in Nashville? Uh, it, in it, Nashville? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think all of my – I didn't go there with anybody I knew from right. Monterey. Right. But obviously I made friends there, and they're still some of my closest friends, but uh, none of them live in Nashville. How was the experience at Macaulay? It was terrifically good for me, probably the single best thing that ever happened to me in my life. How so? Because it created a foundation of thinking education was a good thing and trying to get one. And uh, they really had a strong teacher core and student core of principled mm -hmm. people. I mean, that's, uh, to me, the foundation of my religious beliefs my ethical, moral beliefs, and everything started right there at Macaulay School, I think. What year, for me. Bob, did you graduate from I, Macaulay? 1958. Started in the fall of 54, graduated in 58. What, um, what did you do after your graduation from Macaulay in Chattanooga? From Macaulay? Well, I came to Vanderbilt, and I came to Vanderbilt on a U.S. Navy scholarship, which I had uh, take an exam for and competed for at Macaulay, and okay. I won a scholarship uh, to go to actually three different schools, any one I could choose, uh, and have the Navy pay for my college education. The compensation for that, though, was spending four years in the Navy. Now I think it's probably five or six, right. but then it was four. And my idea was, I'd already gotten interested in flying, and I was going to come to the Navy scholarship and go in the Navy and go into flight school, you know. My dad didn't like that much, so after I'd been down here about two years, and before I turned 21, when you could actually get out of your contract in right. those days, right. we had an option to either sign for certain or back out, and so we backed out. And I went to the reserve program, so I only stayed in the Navy two years instead of four. How did uh, how did you like Vanderbilt? I liked Vanderbilt very much. Made a lot of friends there. I think it was a great school at the time, and probably, uh, doubt it still is. But I liked Vanderbilt, but I didn't work very hard there. I couldn't believe how, uh, well, for instance, the first year, I turned in all my old Macaulay themes to my English teachers and got great grades on them because I, of course, had the benefit of correcting the errors on the high school. But uh, I also couldn't believe you didn't have anything to do after about noon every day. Classes were over at noon. And of course, in the spring, I played baseball. And that was good. But oh, I kinda, did you play for the Vanderbilt team? Yeah, and you could only play varsity ball in those days three years. So I played right. freshman team my first year, and then I played varsity baseball sophomore, junior, and senior year. What was your position? We weren't very good. I was a pitcher. I had the record of being the shortest pitcher in the SEC. Yeah. I played a little outfield, too, when I wasn't pitching, but mostly as a pitcher. How did, uh, how did your studies go at Vanderbilt? My studies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I passed without uh, – having to go to summer school, or I passed in four years. So my goal was to stay out of summer school and graduate on time, but I didn't have any big desire to get above the sea level. So I was a mediocre student. I think you told me that uh, <coughs> you, you majored in English. I did, majored uh -huh. in English. And then I guess there wasn't, let's see, you graduated in, in 1962? 62 from Vanderbilt. And there wasn't much question about where you were headed then because you no. had the Navy scholarship. You get a commission when you graduate, go in the Navy. And I was assigned to a destroyer based in Mayport, Florida, which is Jacksonville. And in, tell us a little bit about your Navy career. You know, did you see the world in the Navy or was your. I assignment? saw the Atlantic side of the world, let's <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> We did have, I had a good experience in the Navy, and this destroyer was, uh, I was going, I was in 24 months, and we spent 19 of them at sea, I mean, on, on operations somewhere. So I didn't have the misfortune of some of my buddies who went aboard a ship in a shipyard and had to rent an apartment and stay in some shipyard city for 12 months before they ever saw the first wave. I got underway like two weeks after I got on board. 
Did you travel to Europe? Uh, yeah, we destroyed? went to the Mediterranean okay. and did all the countries around the Med. And that was back, Cold War was hot. Mm -hmm. And so the big competition was to outshine the Russians in all these places we'd go where we wanted to be the most powerful looking ships and the nicest people. Uh, it was nice. But we went to the usual places in the Med, Spain, Italy, Greece, Beirut, any, uh, Egypt, Red Sea. Did you have any touchy or especially exciting experiences in the Navy? Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, that really? First thing that I got into. And uh, I had only been aboard the ship about three months. I went aboard July 1, and on about Saturday, I'm guessing October the 18th or so, we had an emergency get underway thing. And uh, I was, so we, we got the ship underway with about half the crew and about half the officers. We normally had 16 officers and about 220 crew. And we got underway with, I think, 10 officers and about 110 crew, which meant everybody double duty. So I was lucky to be on that because we, we had to leave everybody back in Jacksonville. And we and another destroyer met the Enterprise, our first nuclear carrier, and escorted them to Cuba because they were going to strike Cuba. And then Kennedy made the speech, the famous speech, I think that Monday night. We got underway Saturday, in which they declared a quarantine of Cuba rather than a strike to Cuba. And that's when they put the blockade up. But we stayed with the Enterprise and went down below Jamaica and orbited down there for till right around Christmas <laughs> in case they decided to strike something because the Enterprise was a strike force. Right. And some other carrier group was the quarantine, the blockade people. Did, um, so I got to stand on four hours and off four hours for about two or three months, and that, you can learn all about the ship, doing yeah. it four hours on and four off, 724. I think you mentioned to me that there was someone that you met in the Navy that had some real yeah. impact on the rest of your life. Tell us a little bit sure about did. that. Yeah, I think it was the summer of, uh, well, it may have been the spring of 64. I think, but in any event, um, we had re reserve officers would come aboard that were in Naval Reserve units all around the country and they had to do their two week duty. And the executive officer called me down one day and said, I want you to go to the airport. We got a reserve commander coming aboard and we got a place for him to you know, sleep up in officer's quarters and all and he's gonna be assigned to your watch and you're off watch this afternoon. He'd be flying in at one o'clock go to the airport, get him, bring him back, get him settled, and he'll be in your watch. And this guy's name was William Robinson. I'm pretty sure it's Robinson. And he was from Kansas City, and uh, so I did that. And on the drive, you know, we talking about it, and he's a lawyer from Kansas City. So I had a car there in, in Jackson in the, at the Mayport, and we got on the same watch, so we were on duty at the same time, and we had the same free Saturdays or Sundays or sometimes both. And he said, look, you got your car. I'll buy you dinner every night if you'll just take me around and we'll go to different restaurants and bars and see what, I want to see what Jacksonville Beach is like. So that was the way we did it. And he, all he could talk about was his law practice. I mean, he had this case for this woman that, you know, her husband had died and she couldn't, and she was supposed to inherit and she couldn't. And then there's another case. And, and he's talking about his law business all the time. The fellow's history was that he had been in the Navy as an officer on a destroyer named the Edwards. And the Edwards was sunk in the South Pacific during the Second World War, and he was on it and was a survivor from the sinking. And what had sunk it was a kamikaze coming in, and they shot it down. And the plane hit the water and broke up, and the engine, from the plane, skipped across the water and went through the side of the destroyer and blew up the engine room mm -hmm. and the boiler room. Kind of an odd kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he'd stayed in the Navy, gotten through the war, 
gone to law school, got his law degree, and was practicing law. And he was so excited about his career. I mean, he just liked it. And I'm guessing he was 50 at the time, probably. We were 17, 18 years after the war. No, I guess we were, yeah, about 18 years. And uh, so, uh, well, that's really something that he's so excited about what he's doing. So he left two weeks later, and I took him to the airport. And he, goodbye, you know. And about two or three weeks later, I got this package in the mail, and it was from him. And he wrote me a letter and said, I think you might be interested in reading these three books from Senate. And uh, he sent me three books I still have. One of them was called The Powers of Attorney by a guy named Louis Auchincloss. And it's about a New York corporate lawyer putting deals together, all that style of stuff. The other one was Louis Neiser, yeah. My Life in Court, which a lot of people right. have read. Right. And it was about six or seven That's big good. lawsuits that he handled. One of them for Richard Nixon, I think. And the other one was a book called, uh, it's in paperback now, called The Art of Cross-Examination by a fellow named Francis X. Wellman. And he had been a New York what I call sweatshop lawyer back at the turn of the century when they had all these women working in these sweatshops and probably children, you know, 14 hours a day. And every now and then there'd be some disaster in the sweatshop, a fire or something, he'd kill 50 of them. And there'd be lawsuits coming out of it. And he had tried lawsuits for the city of New York for a long time. And then as a, just a defense lawyer and a plaintiff's lawyer too, but he was on his feet, trial lawyer was all he did back in the day before they had discovery. Exactly. Before they had electronic stuff for sure. Didn't even have Xerox machines. And you were pretty much on your own on your feet. And it's a great book. I used to get copies of it and give it to the, some of the young lawyers in the firm, you know, to read as a really good book about how to actually stand up and ask questions and what not to ask and things like that. Well, I'm guessing that this got you thinking about the it possibility. Did. Yeah, I did start thinking about that big time, going to law school, being a lawyer. I'd never thought about being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I was always kind of destined to go home and get with my brother in the lumber business. Hence, I didn't see any big need to do anything better than graduate from Vanderbilt, you know, as far as grade-wise. And so I did that. I went home, went in business with my brother in July of 64. And it didn't take, I was cruising timber, you know, walking in the woods, counting trees, figuring out what we could pay some farmer to let us come in there and cut his oak and poplar and uh, making deals like that. I had a closing sitting under a tree where I wrote the man a check and he handed me a deed. That was a closing. I got, the law, got to be a lawyer and the closing turned out to be a big deal. I mean, you know. <laughs> But after about six or seven months, I figured, you know, this little business ain't going to support both my brother with three children and me with nothing yet but something. So I came down, took the LSATs, and did all right on them, and decided I'm going to go to law school. So I applied to Vanderbilt, got in, went to law school, fall of 65. Very good. And um, how did it go at law school? Well, I went fine law school. I did better than I thought I was going to do after talking to some of my friends who graduated from Vanderbilt in 62 with me, fraternity brothers, and George McGugan was one of them. Right. And, and how, how hard law school was, and so they had me scared to death. They graduated in the spring of 65. So I got in here and I started studying right away. You know, I was scared to death from what all they said. And I did a lot better than I thought I'd do. Came out real well, got good job offers, and went to work for Bass. Any, um, any classes or professors that stand out in the law school experience with you? Oh, yeah. We had uh, yeah, great ones. Uh, of course, Dean Wade, I thought, was a terrific torch lawyer, restitution teacher, I mean. Mr. Hartman stands out in everybody's mind who had Mr. Hartman. Absolutely. And he was... I mean, you'd learn how to stand up and talk and be sure of yourself and take criticism, you know? Yeah. And it was a very good experience for when you finally get in front of a judge that's a little rough on you, 
who will wind up, as you and I discussed the other day, teaching you more than one that's not. But they stand out big time. Bob Covington was stands out in my mind as a real good teacher. He taught legal methods and all. It was real good and all that. So you, you would have graduated, Bob, I'm guessing in May of... Uh, of um, 68? Yeah, yeah. And? May or June, yeah, 68. Had you clerked at all during your law school experience? I don't know if they had yeah. clerked. Yeah, after the summer much. of my first year, which would be the summer of 66, I clerked for Bob Taylor and Tom Slaughter, who had an old firm in the Life and Casualty building. Over there. And, uh, you know, I did the usual stuff, went to court with Tom and- uh, Right. I think Taylor was an election going on at that time, and Taylor was one of the big supporters and pushers of Ellington. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the fence was John Hooker, John Jay, right? right. And my roommate then in law school was a fellow named Bob Hart from Pensacola, and he worked for Hooker, Hooker, and Willis, who obviously were supporting Hooker. So we'd have tremendous arguments at night back in the room over a beer. <laughs> about it. <laughs> he and I are still great friends. In fact, he was up here about a week ago. So I, I gather you worked after law school for about a year for Tom Slaughter and then... No. Oh, did you? I was summer clerking only. Oh, after my okay. second year, I summer clerked for Bass Bear and Sims. And then that's who I ultimately went to work for. So the summer of 67, I worked for Bass Bear and Sims as a clerk. Very good. And then finished my senior year, married somewhere in there, and then got my first job at Bass Bear and Sam's. What, how many lawyers had there been at Bass Bear and Sam's by the time you came? When I got there, there were 11. I was number 12. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> by the time you left. <laughs> I think they had about 200, and that didn't count the Memphis office because uh, they just got into the Memphis office when I left. I left with the nine, seven other lawyers. Eight of us left and started our own firm there in uh, actually January 1 of 2000 was our start date, so we left at the end of 99, and they had just hooked up with the Memphis thing about that time, so I think they probably had. Well, I want to ask you some more about sort of that rich history you had at Bass, Barry, and Sims. But before I do, you mentioned you had gotten married. Tell us a little bit about yeah. your wife and yeah. your family. Uh, I met my wife at, uh, well, she'd gone to Vanderbilt, and I knew her there. But we didn't date much, if at all. I mean, she thinks we had a couple of dates. I frankly don't remember. As I said, my undergraduate days at Vanderbilt are kind of a blur. But a freshman year in law school, there's some kind of a, uh, a party or an event that they put on and she's supposed to do skits of the professors. And the powers that be in my freshman class of 154, by the way, appointed me to play the role of Mr. Hartman. I guess because we're both short. <laughs> and. Uh, so I kind of had to go to this thing. I was more or less a bookworm in those days. I'd, I'd get out of school, go play handball at the Vanderbilt gym, then go up to my apartment and study and go to bed. So I needed a date, and I called a friend I knew from Vanderbilt, and saw a story, whoever I was looking for wasn't available. She said, well, why don't you, uh, I think a friend of ours that you know her, Babs Hawkham, is going to come to town this weekend for somebody's wedding, and I bet if you agreed to take her to the wedding, she'd go to this party with you. I said, I, I thought she got married. Whatever happened to her? She said, no, well, she's not married. She's working in Atlanta. Sure. That's how we hook up, November of 65. Though so we dated then from a distance till sometime in 66, and we married in spring, spring vacation of 67. Married in March of 67. and uh, While you were still in law school? Still in law school. I was finishing my second year. Right. Law school. We lived in a duplex out there on Brighton, which is not there anymore. NBA has taken it. But we had a duplex that the 
we paid $125 a month, and the guy that owned it was a lawyer up here at the state tax department. And he gave me $10 off of my rent if I mow, would mow the yard. So I mowed the yard <laughs> to a duplex. It was about the size of this room. And got $10 off my rent. And uh, we still married. We passed our 49th anniversary this past March. Well, congratulations. Now tell me a little bit about your children. Got three. Got a boy, 48. He's married. Uh, What's his three, name? Three children. Hudson Walker. Okay, and what is Hudson doing? Then? Hudson is a home builder, custom home builder, independent on his own in Nashville and builds all around West Nashville, Leapers Fork, places like that. And he's been doing that. He went to work for a good builder here in town back in the late 90s, and the guy kind of just turned the business over to him. And he's been doing that since, oh, I think since about 98. What a wonderful thing years. to be doing in Nashville these days. Yeah, and he's busy now, of course. And he stayed busy during the downturn, but he's apparently, by all accounts, does a good job. I guess people don't come up to you and tell you your children are doing bad. But I have a lot of people to come up and say he's doing well. And then I have a daughter who's 45, Jenny, and she's married to uh, Hill Linderman, and he's a sporting goods, outdoor equipment manufacturers rep with a company called William Miller Company. <clears throat> they have two children. Are they living here they in They live town? here in Nashville, too. Yeah. They all live uh, close to us. And uh, then I have a third, a second son, third child, who is, will, he's 39. Mm -hmm. He's married. Married a girl from Memphis that was teaching school in Nashville. And they live in Birmingham, been married a couple of years. What's his name? Andrew Walker. Okay, and what does Andrew do, Bob? Andrew is a commercial industrial real estate risk analyst for Regions Bank okay. in Birmingham. And they're expecting their first child in August. Okay. Let's go back now to the late 90s, and you've just joined Bassberry and Sims. Late right 60s. Late 60s, I'm sorry, right out of law school. Who was there, and what was it like? Well, it was exciting. Who was there was, of course, Mr. Bass, who is still there, and he'll be 106 in July. He was there. Bill Berry was a senior, I'd say the second guy in the firm, a senior and a tax lawyer and business lawyer. And uh, Woody Sims, Wilson Sims, I'll tell you a little thing about him in a minute. Uh, Frank Gorell was there, who mm -hmm. was a trial lawyer and a polit politician. Right. Was lieutenant governor about the time I came there. Got his response. Lieutenant governor he came in and dumped a bunch of files on my desk and says, "Handle these lawsuits, and if you have any questions, call Woody." You know. <laughs> <laughs> Sink or swim. <coughs> a gentleman named Frank Berry was there. Frank passed away about 1988. And uh, Ted Pappas was a managing partner, and Ted was there. He's still around, but he's retired. Ted's about 90 now. Woody is 90. Uh, Jim Bass Jr. was there, and he had finished law school uh, probably 62, maybe, mm -hmm. Vanderbilt. Uh, his younger brother, Warner Bass, was there, and he had finished in 65. Um, Brad Reed was there, who just passed away this last January. And Brad had come with Bass in 64 after finishing law school that year. Russ Morris was a labor lawyer, was in the same class right. with Brad. And then there was another lawyer who's not there anymore named Bud Gerlock. And Gerlock was there. He was the next senior guy up from me, and the next, next to the bottom, I guess. And uh, he was there until the early 80s, and he went to work with American General after they bought NLT out. I remember that. What, um, you know, did you start out as a, headed to trial law, or 
How did you get going? No, my favorite stuff when I got out of law school was tax, believe it or not. I think I made the best grades in tax, so I kind of liked that. And I thought, well, so, but I went to work for Bass because I'd been around looking at firms in Atlanta and all these places, and I didn't want to really leave around here. And I met them, worked for them one summer, and really liked them. And I thought, well, I can get in some pretty good tax stuff with Bill Berry. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out that Mr. Berry was such a conservative lawyer, none of his clients ever got any kind of trouble <laughs> that I wanted to deal with. <laughs> And uh, <coughs> I remember the first issue was one of his wealthy clients had bought a car in Europe or something on a big trip and had it shipped back and then wanted to get in a fight with IRS over whether he had to pay $440 of some kind of import tax. That was a big deal for him. And we went over and argued that to the administrative people, but there wasn't much there. And then, of course, Woody and, and, and Frank Garrell just saw new new blood coming in the door and they start dumping these lawsuits on me and they were represented at the time Vanderbilt's principal malpractice insurer which was uh, St. Paul Insurance yeah. Company and uh, they started dumping over malpractice cases on me and that's when I started trying things. I also did a lot of real estate work back then because Frank Berry represented a company called Dobson & Johnson which was a, the largest real estate firm in town by far. Absolutely. And I they had a lot of deals going on. Uh, you know, they yeah. Al would go out and cook up deals so he could have clients to let him lease their property and do their deals. And that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed all that. But uh, I kind of gravitated toward just trial work. I kind of liked it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did like it. And uh, seemed to be suited well enough for it. So. Everybody, I think, in their trial career has one case that sort of really gets them going and launches them, uh, it makes them feel like they can do the work. Any case stand out with you at the beginning? Yeah, and it, usually the case you're describing is one where uh, other lawyers seem to recognize that, hey, this guy ain't bad. <laughs> you know, he can do it. And that was a case I, I brought as a plaintiff's lawyer against. Uh, Mitsubishi Aircraft Company and the engine manufacturer and some others, but it was we tried it in federal court in Knoxville, Eastern District, Tennessee, before Judge Taylor, who there's books written about. Uh, but that turned out to be a tremendously fun and rewarding experience. I mean, we got a, a great big judgment, which at the time was the largest personal injury verdict in Tennessee and, and stayed that way for about six years. And How so much I, was it? It was five and a half million dollars for a single mm. single death. And uh, Was this an engine well, failure case? Yeah, so. 500 of the five and a half was for the air, aircraft, but we got that too, he owned the aircraft. Right. And uh, was it what? Was it an engine failure? Case. Actually, it was. It was a design in the way the propeller pitch is controlled by the engine, depending upon the power setting and the uh, what's called a, uh, I forget what the other lever is, I've flown them, but, but anyway, depending on the power settings, what pitch the propellers will be in, whether they'll be in, in high speed, which is narrow, low, high RPM, low pitch, or whether they'll be in what's called beta range, which is, to the common guy, reverse, okay? You've, you've been in planes where they reverse when they land to slow yep. the plane down? Exactly. Well, jets do it a different way, obviously. They don't have a propeller. But propeller planes do it by reversing the pitch of the propeller blade, and it slows it down. It's not supposed to happen in the air. If it happens in the air, it ain't gonna fly. <laughs> right. And so uh, this case was based on the principle one of those propellers went into beta range while the plane was making an approach to an airport in Morristown and caused it to go back on that left side and just roll over and auger right in the ground and kill five people. Very briefly, you, I think, told me a story about your cross-examination of an expert in that case. Tell us about how you figured out the what to do there? 
see how to do this so it's uh, simple for anybody that might listen to this 20 years from now. Um, anybody that knows anything about flying knows that the, the you have to take into account air pressure and temperature when you're reading your gauges as to how fast you're going and of course how high you are now. And the performance of an airplane wing or a propeller is is affected by temperature, air pressure, and speed. And the whole point here was that we had to prove that one of these propellers went into the reverse while the plane was flying about 120 knots. That's 120, that's 138 miles an hour, okay? The defense was that the design of this is such that it will not go into reverse at anything lower, I mean, at anything above 110. So they got on the stand and testified about that. And the way the expert from the engine company did it was he said they had rigged up the cams in the engine so they could put it in reverse and take it back out and see if it would go in reverse. Try to put it in reverse and see if it happened. Like if you're gonna test the brakes, yeah. try to put the brakes on. If it don't go on, you got a default, right? So they're gonna try to put it in reverse. If it went in reverse, they'd know they had a problem. If it didn't go in reverse, they're fine. <coughs> well, I heard him testifying about that. And he said that he took pictures of the cockpit during this test so we could show people what the speeds were. But they hadn't developed the pictures. Just testified about it. He held a roll of film up. And I'm sitting there with my buddy John Bryant, and I said, you know, uh, there's no way that guy is stupid enough to try to put that plane in reverse unless he is way high in the air. So he's got time to either bail out or bring the plane under control. So when he finished testifying, I asked the judge to adjourn for the day and let order them to give us that film of tape so I could look and see what the altimeter said the airplane was. So Judge Taylor did that, and they brought the film over to us about 7 o'clock at night at the hotel, and we had it rigged up with a photography shop there, <clears throat> took it out to them. They developed the film. Sure enough, he's out there in the middle of Phoenix, Arizona, at 15,800 feet when he tries his test, and the temperature is about 20 degrees hotter than it would have been in Knoxville, I mean, because it's Arizona, even though he's high. So you put the temperature and the altitude together with the speed that it's showing is 110 on the meter, and he was actually flying about 150 knots. That's the true airspeed. So we go to court the next morning, and I kind of wrapped around him that if you'd have told the jury the true airspeed, you'd have had to tell him 150, and he didn't have anything to do with this guy flying 120 when he went in reverse. And he pretty well went to jelly up there, and uh, it was it was awful. I mean, that's the, the best cross examination <laughs> I ever had done. He just kind of fell apart on it, and they couldn't prove it, and it got through. Uh, it's really fun. To I remember. think that's what sent the jury over the top yep. because they gave us everything we sued for. If he hadn't have tried that little trick, um, you know, might have been a million dollar case. But. Before we leave that case, what was it like to try a case before Judge Taylor? Well, I loved it, but it was uh, it was rambunctious, and he would call on a lawyer, and it could be the other guy or it could be you, for just about nothing, and. Uh, I remember when I went over there to argue uh, <coughs> against a remittitor, I was going on about how some of these people like Johnny Carson were making a million and a half dollars just for getting on television and it didn't amount to anything. And then I took a bunch of cases he had approved way back and put the inflation factor on them and we got by that okay. but. In the course of making that argument, he said, I don't hear any more about Johnny Carson. I don't hear anything about television. Television, they should have never invented television. And he goes off on this tear about television. And uh, I'm thinking, oh, all I'll do is just make an argument about money. <laughs> 
But it's a character. You know, the folks up there in East Tennessee have put together a real good book about Judge Taylor. And it's real good. And everybody submitted their favorite stories. Their favorite stories about him. And it's a great book. And uh, I, I'm trying to remember who did it. I think uh, uh, either Sweeney or uh, one of them did yeah. it over there in his office, I believe. Who is it? Anyway, it's great, but he was something else. Bob, you uh, <coughs> you had a case for I think for a manor that was an antitrust case that was huge. What was that about? Yeah, that was another interesting case. I've been lucky to gotten some really interesting stuff. Um, it was an antitrust case. Service Merchandise was a company in Nashville that sold mail order. I mean, uh, what they call those things? All uh, showroom. Cases, big volume seller, discount prices, big warehouse. You could go in there and buy something cheaper than you could buy that same thing at a full service department store or something. And Amana manufactured refrigerators and freezers and appliances, but they got into the microwave oven business in the mid 70s. And they sold them. By having license, you know, you know, authorized dealers, and right. you couldn't go buy one at a discounted place, mm -hmm. and you had to buy it from a dealer. And with it, you got a cooking school, you got the right and the obligation kind of to come back four nights for thirty minutes and learn how to cook this and that. Because microwave were new, right. and nobody knew how to use them. I mean, some of their stories were awful. This woman washed her poodle and tried to dry it <laughs> off in the microwave. I mean, you know, <laughs> there were all sorts of stuff. So they felt like it, they'd sell more microwave and it'd be a good thing if they would teach people, you know, you can't fry an egg in a microwave. It's gonna blow up the egg and it's gonna make a mess. And don't put the poodle in. So their method of selling was this way. Consequently, you couldn't go to uh, somewhere like, uh, I can't remember the name of it, out there on Dawson, on Thompson Lane now, but a full service dealer and see the microwave and learn all about it, you know. And I think I like that. And then you'd go down to service merchandise and buy it 30% off. Couldn't do that with a manna. And service merchandise didn't like that because their the name of the game is to get brand name products sure. and be able to sell them in there. So they had a, filed a lawsuit, antitrust, said that a manna was violating antitrust law by requiring its dealers to only sell their microwave and to sell it at suggested prices. Well, that would have been a per se violation of antitrust law uh, following the Schwinn case from 1964 to about 77. And what happened in 77 is the Ninth Circuit held in a case called GTE Sylvania versus uh, somebody, GTE versus Sylvania, I guess, that no, a manufacturer allocating the sale of his products among territories and restricting the resale is not per se illegal. It'll be tested under the rule of reason. The rule of reason basically means, what does the jury think about this, okay? So it turned out to be a really good jury case where we needed to establish that Amanda's method of competing with all these other people, I mean, Sharp, uh, everybody made microwaves, and there were 15 or 20 of them that made it, their particular chosen method was to keep the price up, but sell you a cooking school and a good cookbook and a lot of other stuff along with it. Not it, the easiest sell to not, a jury. Not the easiest sell to a jury, because jury said, well, if they are really competing, they'd be lower price. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we did, and uh, the jury agreed with us on that. There's a interesting story about that. I don't know if you want me to tell about the jury and what Judge Wiseman did. I definitely it want was to hear this. I want to hear it. But we tried it for about eight weeks in November and December of 1980. And the jury came back and found for a man that we were not guilty of violating any trust law. It was a big deal. The jury had, he picked 12 people and you just had to have six in federal court at that time. Well, one of the 12 had dropped out, gotten sick somewhere along about Thanksgiving, I think, dropped out, so we had 11 jurors. So when the judge got ready to send the jury back, he, we argued to the, all 11 of them, he charged them all, and then he said the first six of you on the front 
three front and three back, go to the jury room. You all are our jury, the rest of you people. We appreciate your service. Uh, you know, you're going to be dismissed, but sit right there a minute. So he sends the jury of six back in the back. And uh, he says, okay, we'll adjourn court. But before anybody leaves, I've got this idea. Let's find out. How would you all like to find out what these five jurors will do about this case? And I'm thinking, oh, God, I don't want to do that. I mean, that's a bad idea. But, oh, yeah, it'll be fine, Mr. Walker. Let's find out what you do. So uh, the other lawyer agreed to it, and I did. Reluctantly, and those five jurors were four of them against me. They were going to find for service merchandise, and one guy said, I don't know, I'd probably go with them, but you know. I mean, I was losing it five to nothing there, and I thought, oh, God. And then the other lawyer, who was a fellow from Washington, D.C., uh, of course, he's ebullient about the whole thing. He's got up and he's prancing around the courtroom the whole two hours almost that the jury stayed out. And the real, the real jury came in in about an hour and 45 minutes with a defense verdict. <laughs> and I mean, I thought I was going to get whopped. I mean, I was really expecting, you know, $10 million sure trebled for $30 million or something. And we could win the thing. And uh, so I've, I've used that story to tell clients over the years when they talk about we're just going to sue, we're going to go to court, we can't lose this thing. And I said, let me tell you. When you get to court, you're rolling the dice. It's a crapshoot. You can have the best case in the world, and it ain't yeah. but an 80% case. And you can have the worst one, and you got a 20% chance of winning it on some fluke. So you don't know what's going to happen with the jury. But that, I've, That's a great I've, story. I've had conversations with Judge Wiseman about that a lot since then. That was, That's that a, was a hoot. What were you talking about? Story. Raising the temperature in there. Yeah. You Aren't you one of the few lawyers around who's actually tried a class action case? Yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, it was a big consumer class action case against Bell South, which was South Central Bell at the time. And there were four cases, one in Louisiana, one in Mississippi, one in Alabama, one in Tennessee. And they were brought by the Adams and Reese law firm, which now has an office in Nashville, but at the time we're only in New Orleans. And for some reason, our case, Tennessee case, got off and running faster than the rest of them. There was another one brought in, the, in Georgia, I mean, uh, in Florida, but that was against South, uh, Southern Bell, so Bell South, because Bell South was in Georgia and Florida and South Carolina, and South Central Bell was in the middle. But it was also a parallel case, same theory and everything. It had to do with whether uh, the telephone company had unlawfully leveraged their monopoly in the phone service, which they had, a regulated monopoly, leveraged it into selling other products that weren't competitive. And in this case, it was something called the inside wire service. Um, Back in the early 80s, Judge Green broke up the telephone company, AT&T. I remember created that. These seven baby bells. And that created competition. No longer is it all going to be regulated. So you people can get in the cell service. You can get in the service of selling funny-looking telephones. Everybody can own their own phone and all that. So people became the owners of their own wire inside the house from the junction box where the phone wire comes in, all, everything inside of that is owned by you, the homeowner. And if it breaks, you can fix it or you can do without telephone service. So the phone company, when they had to split that, they all came up with this idea, well, y'all need some insurance about that. So if your wire breaks inside the house, the phone company will still come fix it, but we got to charge you in some place a dollar and a quarter a month and it's just rolled on the bill you know nobody knows you You look up there and you see federal taxes and you see something else and you see this inside wire and all and you know people are just paying the phone bill so the theory was this is all a big hoodoo they don't really have a choice about this because they don't know anything and you're taking your leverage from being the only telephone supplier by law in that community <coughs> and attaching the service on it. That's what the lawsuit was all about. Where was it filed? It was. It, this one was filed and tried in Greenville, Tennessee, in federal court. 
and we, we, it was filed about June of 92, and we tried it in uh, January, February, and March of 94. Three months? Yeah, we started about the 20th of January and finished about the 23rd or 4th of March. So I don't know what that is, two months yeah. roughly. It seemed like it was longer than that because I was up there from right after Christmas. And uh, we tried it, jury. It turned out to be nine people on the jury, and the result of it all was the jury was hung seven to two against me. But I felt like I had a major victory. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, the judge said, well, we're not going to try this thing again. And I want everybody to mediate this. So he ordered mediation, which wound up resolving the cases in all the other states as well. And uh, in our case, I mean, we, we, we'd offered them $20 million, and that wasn't our top dollar. And they, would, they wouldn't get a nickel below 90 just for Tennessee. So we felt like we came out of that pretty well. And that was, that was, a, that was part of the hardest case I did because we were up. I mean, I remember spending 18, 19 hours a day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday, I wouldn't touch anything. And everybody else who was up there would go home. And I just stayed in Greenville in the motel and in my car and drove around the countryside. <clears throat> Didn't think about the case. It's a nice place Monday morning, to drive Sunday around. morning when they started driving back in there, yeah. Yeah, that's when I learned about all those rivers that you guys like to go trout fish in. There's some great rivers up oh, there. And that's beautiful country. It's beautiful country. It really is. It really is. One other case I wanted to ask you about, and then you may want to add, add some more, but I remember it because I represented one of the executives that was involved in a way. And that was, didn't you, rec didn't you represent uh, Murray, Ohio? Yeah. Sure. When uh, when they were under fire to be purchased, what what happened on that? And what what tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Murray, Ohio, was a manufacturer of bicycles and lawnmowers, power equipment, and bicycles, and uh, they'd been here for a number of years, and they were a regular client of Bassberry. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my early good experiences was uh, Woody Sims and John Bryant and I split up the country and tried and defended them on products liability cases everywhere. And we did that for, I don't know, a number of years. I kind of quit doing it about the mm -hmm. mid 80s. But their stock was selling below what people thought it was really worth in the market. And in the mid 80s, there was a big run of hostile takeovers. Uh, investment bankers would see something, they'd find folks willing to come in and make a bid to buy the stock. And uh, they, uh, outfit called Electrolux, which you know from vacuum cleaners, sure. but it's a great big Swedish company, conglomerate, put a bear hug letter on the directors of Camaro High about April, I think April 29th, 1987 or eight, I can't remember. And a bear hug letter says, we want to buy your company and we're willing to pay X. Well, the, fact of that is they've got to do something with it, including making it public. So when you make it public, all of a sudden the stock starts moving around because the arbitrary jurors start buying it. Other competitors may come in and top the bid. So what has to be done is you try to stop legally the takeover effort so they can't go buy any more stock. And so we filed a lawsuit in federal court here, actually filed in state court, but wound up in federal court to enjoin them for various violations of the Securities Act of 1934 in terms of what they disclosed when they gave their bear hug letter and all. They hadn't made a full disclosure. And the whole point of it all is to try to stop them so you can have time to negotiate a better deal either with them or with a new buyer. Right. And that got a lot of publicity and we tried it for five days in front of Judge Wiseman again in federal court. Um, and it was, you know, highly visible because they didn't have cell phones out in 1988. So all these uh, 
the lawyers in town, you probably may represent one of them. George, I know George Crawford did, but they would be over there representing some investment bank in New York that wanted firsthand feedback from the lawyer as to who's winning, who's you know who's going to win this, which side, which way should we bet? Should we buy the stock or be selling the stock? You know, and that's going on. People are running out in the hall at the courthouse to get on one of those two pay phones that were out there, and. Uh, so anyway, at the end of five days of preliminary injunction was what the trial was. Yeah. Uh, Judge Wiseman ruled against us. We had not made out a case that they should be enjoined. So we appealed it immediately to the Sixth Circuit. They impaneled three judges and sent them down here the following Thursday or Friday. I mean, within a week, we had briefed it fully and argued it in front of the panel of three judges in the Customs House. Gil Merritt was one of the judges. Can't remember who the other two were. One of them, I think, was that judge from uh, Kentucky that was a real sharp guy, wore a bow tie all the time. I can't think of his name right now, but we argued it to them. It took them about four days to affirm Judge Wise, but <laughs> we lost. <laughs> Meanwhile, however, a white knight had turned up, willing to pay more money than Electrolux. So they made a much better deal selling the stock at about twice the price that Electrolux had wow. tried to get it for. And uh, so that was a fast moving thing that uh, went from about April 29th till about May the 20th and it was yeah. all over. So that was a hoot. Looking back, Bob, um, you're, you're, the firm of, of Bass Bear and Sims had phenomenal growth during all of that period from, I guess, roughly 1970 through 2000. What was that like? How was that managed? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, I can. I was on the committee that kind of managed the firm mm -hmm. many of those years in there, like from about, we didn't really get a form of committee till probably 78. I think I was on the first one and it lasted till about 85 and then they had five new people come on in and that we got that changed pretty quick and people didn't think that was going too well so they put some of us back on again and I was on that through about 95. Uh, from the view on the inside I thought it was managed pretty well but given the fact you don't, you know, we lawyers don't know much about managing business in the first place. Not only that, firms were just then beginning to grow by going region-wide or nationwide. And there was a big argument as to whether the right way to do that was to go merge with an existing firm somewhere or move your people into somewhere and try to colonize it. Exactly. And uh, Bass, early on, really wasn't into doing that much at all. And the first one we did was in Knoxville. And we had an opportunity up there to hook up with two or three, or maybe four, I can't remember, really good lawyers whose firm, for one reason or another, had kind of slid down. The older people had died or retired. And uh, Bruce Foster was the number one guy that we were looking at. And Bruce at the time was probably 55 or 6. So we joined them into the law firm and opened the Knoxville office. And I'm going to guess that was about 1985 or no, probably 88 or 90, right in that time frame. And uh, then we had a couple of lawyers we'd hired coming out of usually UT and stay, wanted to stay there and practice. And then uh, and I think one or two of our people wanted to go over there. They had a connection to Knoxville. And that office, as far as I know, is still open, doing okay. Mm -hmm. About the time we left, the ne only uh, next one we did while I was there was in Memphis, and that was about the time we left. And they did the same thing. They joined up with a group, a bigger group, that wanted to leave the firm they were in. And I don't even remember what the firm was. But they uh, brought them in and then added a bunch of people to it, and I think it got to be maybe 35, 40 lawyers. Um, but what it was like in the firm, uh, it just seemed like there was a lot more 
administrative management running around. But as far as my practice and dealing with the litigation group that we had, we just had more bigger things to work on. And they had a very good corporate section, always have had. And they ginned up some lawsuits that, you know, you'd have to, you know, you'd be really lucky to get them. And, and we were lucky to get some real interesting lawsuits. I mean, Brad's number one client was Jack Massey. It seemed like he always had something that needed to be handled. Yeah, I remember I had a Miss Winters case, and I think Dick Lodge and yep. Brad. And, That's right. And Tony and that group handled that. And then the bank, I got to pay you this compliment. The bank gave us a lot of business, and you hit me for the first big, big verdict <laughs> I ever lost there. <laughs> Tried that case against me in 1978, got a million and a quarter dollars. I got lucky on one witness in that case. That's all I did. <laughs> Tell me about, um, as you moved on closer to 2000, I think you, you, made a, you made a decision to sort of go on your own. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I will. Uh, two of the young partners I still have with me at Butler Snow now, Joe Welburn and John Hayworth, asked me one afternoon late. We were up there, and it was probably 6 o'clock. They came in and said, why don't we go to dinner? We need to talk to you about some stuff. And this was in January of 98. I called my wife, said, man, I'm going to go to dinner with John Joe. You know, I'll be home later. It's okay. So we went down to this place that's not there now. It's a holding ground. Shinnockies or something like that. It was an yes. Irish name. Yes, an Irish pub. Something. Yeah. And uh, they said, you know, we've been thinking about we want to go out on our own and have our own law firm and just do litigation. And we want to talk to you about that and whether you do that with us or not. Just out of the blue. And I said, hey, gee whiz, guys. I said, uh, it's kind of a shocker that you two guys are, you know, headed for the corner offices, so to speak. I mean, y'all are going to have great careers here. You're a good law firm. Yeah, we like it. We like everybody. But, you know, it's getting too big. we got so many people. Uh, we just really would like to just do our own thing in litigation. And we'll you know, we don't need a corporate section. We don't need a tax section. We don't need a labor section. And go through. The, and I said, well, hey, have you thought about this much? I said, oh, yeah, we've already got some pro formas laid out here. Joe rolls out. <laughs> He's been working all Christmas on pro forma. And then I found out they'd been talking to Mark Tips, who at the time was not with Bass. At the time, Mark was doing, I think, Fred Thompson's investigation of the Buddhist monks or whatever. They, they had some big scandal that, that Mark was his uh, chief counsel on this committee that Senator Thompson had been appointed by the Republicans to investigate. So he was up in Washington and wanting to get back here big time. He, he got pretty sick of Washington. So they'd been conspiring with him about it. And I said, well, who have y'all got in mind? And they said, well, we definitely want you and we definitely want John Bryant to come with us. And uh, we hadn't thought much beyond that. I said, well, let me think about that a little while. So anyway, I did. And I came back and I said, okay. <coughs> I'm coming up on 59 years old. And uh, I said, I think you guys were a little premature here. Can we just kind of hold this thought without letting it get out? for about a year, because I wouldn't at all want to do it this year, and there was a, a reason for that, is that I had five kind of big things going, cases. And I didn't want to leave and, and take those. I thought that looked awful. Right. And I didn't want to leave and, and not take them, because all those had, at least the client had said, they wanted me, okay, and I don't know. So anyway, I said, well, it's going to take us a year to do this. Meanwhile, Mark's got to finish on the Buddhist monks and whatever else he's got to do up there. And I said, it's okay, okay, but we've got this and we don't forget this. I said, okay. So we kind of messed with it mm -hmm. through that year. We'd talk about it every couple of months or something. And I did go ahead and talk to John about it. John said, yeah, I'm ready. And uh, so as it came around toward the end of 98, uh, I said, well, that was in the 98. I said, 
well, let's, let's plan on this then in the fall of 99. I can finish these cases. That's what it was. And uh, so as we got close to that, we did the cases. And uh, I'm trying to remember here what, uh, what actually uh, precipitated getting some other people in. Yeah, somewhere along the way, they've been doing a lot of work with uh, the young ones had with uh, Steve Anderson. He was a lawyer with us at that time at Bass, and he was doing med mal work. By then, he'd relieved Barfield. And when I got out of doing it, Barfield did it. And when Barfield got out, Steve Anderson took it over. And he had had a lot of these younger lawyers helping him with it. I mean, they liked working with him. He was a good, he's a good you know, technical trial lawyer. <clears throat> so he said, we'd really like to have Steve go with us if he'd do it. And said, I said, well, that'll be awkward about Vanderbilt. Well, it turns out that one of them said something to Steve about it, and Steve was actually thinking at the time of leaving and going in the house at Vanderbilt. And because mm -hmm. he he then came and talked to me about that before we ever knew about this, whether he could do med mal work from in house. And I said, well, generally speaking, in house lawyers don't do a good job for their client when they're in a lawsuit, and the reason is they're not objective about judgment and decisions as to whether this ought to be continued to do this or ought to be settled or this, that, and the other because sure. some vice president's looking at the, in charge of their paycheck. And I think there's a real value to outhouse lawyers being the lawyers who handle litigation matters for right. clients. And I said, so I don't know how that's going to work. But in any event, the result of it was they decided, and we I did too, let's ask Steve. And then Steve wanted to bring Please be bear along. And then something on the trip, so that was seven. And then something where Scott Sims got wind of it. So Scott came in and talked to me and said, if y'all leave, and I'm leaving. So I said, okay. So we set the deal. And we left. Uh, we announced it the Monday before Thanksgiving of 99. Mm -hmm. And did the deal uh, at the end of the year. And... Uh, I remember the hardest thing I had to do in a while up till recently was go in and I told Keith Simmons, who was a manager, that I'd like to have a partner's meeting. And I went into the big place there and we had like 65 partners at that time that showed up. I mean, they were in Nashville. And I told them what I wanted to do. By then the word had gotten out because I told Keith, right. but I explained why. I said, I, my you know, probably five out of my seven closest friends in the world are sitting in here. And I said, so it's not that I'm mad about anything. None of us are. It's been a great place, still a great place. We just decided at this time and place we want to go do something independent. And they want to do it. I'm going to go with them. About time for me to take a new adventure. So at the age of 60, we go do that. Somebody told me the first thing they did, uh, Tips wanted to take out a big life insurance policy on me, so they took out a key man insurance policy. <laughs> so the first thing that happens is I get a heart attack in the summer of, <laughs> of 2000. I have to go in and get open heart surgery. And I always laugh about them being disappointed because that was about to be the best year they ever going to have. <laughs> Bob, I think Gail Malone joined you Gail did. Uh, after and, that. Uh, and, uh, I was talking to the videographer here a while ago. I think the case he first did with the Malones was an airplane crash case that Gail had for some family of some people that were killed in a crash out here at Metro. And Gail asked me to help him with that, you know, yeah. and all. So I was doing that kind of in the shadows. or behind. And Gail did most of the depositions. and. Uh, and all that, and during the course of that case, which happened in about 01, 02, he and I got to talking, and Gail says, uh, you know, I've been with this Miller Martin now about as long as I need to, and would y'all have any interest in uh, me coming up every year or something? I said, yeah, there's just one stipulation. He said, what's that? I said, we've already hired Charlie Malone, that's your son, his son, Charlie. And I said, if anybody puts in a no nepotism rule, you're going to have to leave. <laughs> We're going to keep Charlie. <laughs> but no, that uh, turned out to be really well, 
it worked real well for everybody. And he brought a, well, for one thing, he brought a different training and aspect of handling litigation, which was good because we all came out of the same shop. Yeah, yeah. And Gail came in with a different view. He came out of the Tommy Peebles shop, okay, which was good. So we had new blood into thinking about how to do cases. We also, we kind of laid it out, said, you, we're going to stay here and hit singles, and keep the lights on, and you can take these cases and go swing for the fences with them if you want to. And he hit two or three pretty big cases. I remember he did. Those plaintiffs work pretty yeah, real I, well. I know there was a case in Memphis <coughs> that, uh, that was a, a big verdict uh, several years ago that he had had. Yeah. A really big one. And you had a great run. I mean, you that firm was, what, about 15 years? So. Yeah, we stayed till uh, February, February of 2015. We joined Butler Snow. Right. And uh, uh, we got to talking to them. I, I had a plane crash in uh, October of 13. And I was kind of laid up there a little bit for a while. And Gail had uh, had a conversation with one of their trial lawyers out at an American College meeting. And they were real interested in talking to us. And Gail told them, said, well, you know, we won't wait till Bob gets out of whack here and gets back in the saddle and we'll talk about it. So we did. Yeah. And long about January, February of 14, we uh, talked to them pretty seriously. And we said, we just really are not interested in doing that. We liked what we were doing. We were having success at it and it was but I had begun to worry a little bit about Gail getting a little long in the tooth too and I'd begun to worry a little bit about if my next plane crash I might not walk away from so uh, I said well maybe we ought to talk about if the young ones want to do it let's see about joining a bigger outfit give them a bigger base of business to work on so we messed with that all 14 and finally about Christmas of 14 we told them okay we're interested enough to move forward here so yep. that's why we did it. You mentioned the plane crash and I think one of your great loves and hobbies of life is is piloting. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing that. I soloed when I was a freshman in Vanderbilt and I told you it found out that afternoon and during the day there wasn't anything to do so I went out to Cumberland Airfield, which is now where one of the lagoons is in Metro Center. But that was a grass strip out there and took flying lessons. Cost me $8 an hour. And the Navy was paying me $150 a month while I was in school. So I went out and took flying lessons, started soloing, got my license. And then I've been flying, uh, really I didn't do much while I was in the Navy because I was on a ship. But, uh, flying a lot since uh, about 5,000 hours when I, yeah. I I told somebody it's not bad I flew 55 years before I crashed that's pretty good <laughs> <coughs> tell me I, about some of the other things Bob outside of law practice that you enjoy doing and have enjoyed doing during your life hobbies no nah, well I enjoyed snow skiing big time okay. did that for 25 30 years really like that. I enjoy fishing. I used to hunt more, but I don't really care much about that anymore. I guess I'm getting too old to walk around the woods. But I like fishing. I like just being outdoors, and I've got a farm up in Putnam County, and I, I love to go up there. I've got some cattle on it, and I work it till I don't, you know, I got a fellow that does the hard work, but I enjoy that. You had always sort of been my hero because years ago I heard that you would go I don't know if you flew yourself or hike. flew your dog out to the Wind River Range and yeah. just yeah. hike by yourself. Okay, I, I got on to that idea from an old fine lawyer in Tennessee, Lucius Birch in Memphis. And I was uh, 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 and still am a pretty close friend of Mike Cody's. Yeah. And Mike had worked for Lucius forever. And uh, he was telling me about some things, and I was in Memphis and went over to see Mike, and Mr. Birch was back there in his office, and he was pretty old at the time. And 
Mike says, come around here, I want you to talk to Mr. Birch about this. So I go around there and he gets to talking to me about his trips to the Wind River Range, the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming. And he was getting to where he said he was so old he'd ridden mules. He said, I hiked out there for years and I never got hurt. And the first year I went on a mule, a mule fell on me and broke my hip, which is true. <laughs> Big problem with that. <laughs> And I began to think, well, that sounds like a good idea to me because I kind of like being by myself every now and then. So in 1988 or 89, I decided, and I didn't, I didn't take my dog in the first trip. I just went out there, flew my little plane to Pinedale, Wyoming, went to the hardware store, bought my fishing license, asked somebody where the best way to get into the woods was. I had a backpack. They told me the woman at the motel drove me down to the trailhead the next morning. And I said, uh, come back and get me in about two weeks. I'll be right here. And I walked up in the woods and stayed up there. I don't know how far I walked, but I mean, I walked every day. And uh, well, you hike, so you know how far you're going today, but I puttered at it. But anyway, I went back in there and stayed two weeks and fished and lost 15 pounds and lived off the land. and. Mm -hmm felt great yeah. and uh, so I started doing that every year and I started taking my dog out there just when she got old enough to go and that was probably 92. There's a rumor and I don't know if it's true that one year when you were in the Wind Rivers you ran across some men in black at a at a pass. I did. Tell us about I that. I ran across uh, then Secretary of State Jim Baker and Secretary of Defense uh, Dick Cheney up at a high lake called Rainbow Lake and it's up in the Wind River Range and uh, funny how it happened I was camped down there at my favorite little spot this was about 91 or 2 I think well I don't think I had the dogs it must have been 91 when did that Gulf War start 91 Oh, gosh, I, I think so. It, it may have been 90, but right in there somewhere. And I decided I'd take my fishing gear, and every morning my routine was I'd get up, you know, and make coffee, eat a piece of jerky, put on this vest I had that had a lot of pockets, put some water and stuff, and get a fishing rod or a fly rod, which I was going to use that day, and I'd take off and hike three or four miles to some lake that I wanted to try out. So this day I went up to this place called Rainbow Lake. It was about three miles up there. Got up there, 11,000 feet or so. Beautiful place. And there's this old man. I hadn't seen anybody now in about a week. Seemed like I saw some people on the horses way over once, but uh, I hadn't seen anybody. There's this old man sitting on a rock up there. And I walked up, said something to him. Well, how you doing? You know, or something like that. I ain't doing worth a damn. I said, well. What's wrong? He said, well, everybody in the world is up here. Now you're up here. And I said, well, I don't see anybody but me. And I just got here. And he said, well, look right over that little rise right there. There's a whole crowd over there. So I walked over the little rise. Sure enough, there's this guy sitting there in an olive drab T-shirt with a big antenna sticking up. And I walked up to him and said, you know, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm at Air Force Communications, and we're out here keeping the secretaries in communication with the White House. I said, who, what secretary? And he said, well, Secretary Baker, he's right out there on that rock. Secretary Cheney's right around the corner there and they're fishing. So I go walking around there and sure enough, there is a crowd because Baker's got a couple of his sons there and I sat on the bank and talked to one of them because one of them was a lawyer with the Baker Botts firm who had represented uh, American General in the NLT takeover and he had been involved wow. in that. Wow. And that was 10 years before. Yeah. And uh, I sat there on him. They had guides, they had horses. I mean, that's why I think that's who I saw. They had yellow slickers on the horses. I mean, it looked like one of those movies, you know. <laughs> that's James a, Gang or something. That's a great story. You're, you're all alone in the mountain. All yeah, and you run into the world powers out there. I expect to see Gorbachev out there. <laughs> but. Well, Bob, let's. Um, let's Let's ask a few more questions, if you don't mind, and then we'll wrap it up. Trial law. You've been a big part of it. Has it changed much, and what observations do you have about the future of trial law? Well, it has changed very much, no question about that. And uh, 
I like to think that I'm not going to be an old fogey about it like when I was young and people would say, this ain't the way it used to be. And I'd say, oh, this is that old geezer. I mean, he didn't know what's going on now. When we were talking about using overheads or something in the courtroom. Yeah. But frankly, I think, generally speaking, it has gotten to where law generally and trial law specifically is getting to where it's just a commodity and people want won't pay for hours, won't pay for quick stuff. And I don't think that lawyers are looked at anymore as uh, wise counselors mm -hmm. or their judgment is particularly important. I think particularly going at it from the business realm, the days when the chairman of a bank would look to his number one lawyer to give him advice about whether they ought to be doing this or doing that and what the regulatory requirements be and what kind of trouble they might get into, they're gone. The president of the bank's got a whole staff of people who went to B school and they're smarter than anybody in the, in the room. I think that's happened. I think that uh, the actual trial process now is just the opposite of where everybody wants it to be. And where everybody wants it to be is uh, reasonably fast, but good justice. And what's happened with all this electronic filing and 200 pages of brief papers and motions out the wazoo on every subject matter, including just little discovery issues, you bogged it down with expensive stuff that only the very rich can pay for. And you know, big companies don't mind spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a staff of six lawyers fighting over uh, the search terms that ought to be used and getting into somebody's computer to find out whether they ever wrote an email that sounded a little bit different from what they just testified to. And that's ridiculous. And I think that's where the trial business has gone. And uh, I've had some recent experience lately with some arbitration. I'm uh, not enamored with that either. And there was a time when I thought that might be a solution to this absence of the ability to have a, a quick and sure justice system. But I, thought, I think that's just as bad. I mean, they can spend where you out yep. spending time just picking an arbitrator. And if you leave it to lawyers to bill by the hour, then you've got the best minds in the world working on how many hours can we get in here <laughs> on both sides. And that's a bad system. I've tried to think of an easy fix. I don't know one, but I thought it might be an easy fix to make it absolutely illegal in a federal crime to bill by the hour. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you'd ever get that enforced, right? But. Uh, well, that reminds me of a meeting I had with Lowe Watkins, gosh, 45 years ago, and I was talking to Lowe, and he said, oh, he says, I don't bill by the hour. He said, young man, he said, I might have a million-dollar idea any minute. <laughs> like that old story about the guy, his computer isn't working or his big system in the office, and he called the guy in, the guy opens it up, takes the screwdriver out, does that, so things lit up, everything's running. Sent him a bill for $10,000. He said, $10,000? He said, all you did was turn the screw. He said, well, it cost you $5 to turn the screw. But it was $9,999 for knowing which screw to turn. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, just, just a few more things? Looking back, not forward, but back now for a minute, any particular judges or lawyers that um, impacted your career and your life that you want to mention? Um, well, there's several. Yeah, I mean, frankly, the lawyers who were at Bass when I got there and who influenced me early in terms of giving me work to do and showing me the right way to do it, I mean, I, I, I couldn't have been luckier than to have fallen in with those guys. Woody, Frank Gorell, Mr. Bass, Bill Berry, Frank Berry, Jim, all that bunch, Brad. And on top of it, they had a, enough body of, quote, big business, business business, 
to generate some really interesting problems, and that impacted me. I also think I've told uh, Joe Loser about this. I think Joe Loser did about as much as any judge I ever appeared to get me on the right path to knowing how and what to do in a courtroom and what not to do. I mean, I remember going over there and just beating my head against Lewis Hollenbaugh and uh, Doug Fisher. Well, that could wear you out over there. And uh, Judge Loser, I must have tried three or four phone, telephone company cases in front of him over there. And, you know, I'd try to put on them, they'd object, he'd sustain it. I'd object to something he'd over it. And after, sooner or later, I learned what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And I was, used to tell Joe that. Um, I think we had a good fortune of trying lawsuits and being here about the time that Judge Morton came and got on the stand, got on the bench, and that was 1970 or 71, but right in there. And I had a little taste of what it was like before that. Judge Miller is who he, whose seat he took. I think Judge Miller died then or something, but he retired. But he was a good man. Nice guy, but that docket, maybe because he was getting older or something, but it was like four years behind. I mean, he, nobody removed the case to federal court if they could help it. It's like Knoxville. None of the Knoxville lawyers wanted to be in federal court with Judge Taylor, but all for a different reason. Here, if you had something you wanted to bury, could get it removed to federal court, it was buried over there for four or five years. Yeah. And I don't. I tried some cases in front of Judge Gray, and they were okay. He, would, but I don't think he had a fast docket either. Well, when Judge Morton came in, he cleaned that docket up in a hurry, and then just his handling of the trial of a case was firm, was fair. But he didn't take any. He wouldn't listen to a bunch of BS, yeah. and he could sniff it out when it was coming at him. And I think he did. A, probably more for the federal court system here than anybody in my career. I think we've had some really good judges. I think Judge Wiseman was a terrific trial judge. And I think he is because he tried cases for 15 years or so before he got in there. He's also smart. Uh, you know, I think we've got some smart judges there now. Unfortunately, they're getting there at a time when it's an electronic thing. You might as well just push a button and see what the answer is. I saw something the other day that says that IBM's Watson, you know what that is? Mm -hmm. IBM's come up with Watson, you can ask Watson something, it's better than Siri. But uh, Watson gives legal answers that are 90% accurate against lawyers on the same questions or 70% accurate. Now I don't know who did that, but it's that's, it's written, that has been in the national news. But I think that may be where things head. Man, the amount of paper that they have to deal with once it all gets converted to paper over there, yeah. I don't see how any human being can do that. They do it. Bob, this has, been, uh, this has been more enjoyment than a lawyer deserves to have. I really appreciate it. Is there anything that we've missed that's important in your career that you wanted to I don't mention? think so. I would say that uh, from career-wise, <clears throat> the, the best decision I made was joining Bass Bear and Sam in 1968, and the next best decision I made was leaving in, in 2000. Both of them were good decisions. And I was lucky with that, you know, just the turn of the worm turned out that way, but not that they are not a great firm, but just doing it at that time in my life when we could, I could go with these young kids that turned out to really be a good experience to kind of end your career there on a 15 year run as a, what, 10 to 17 lawyer firm we had there. Yeah. I think when we moved into Butler Snow, we were 15, so it worked fine. Good people. Well, thank you. Thank you for spending the time to share some of the um, really amazing career with us. And I believe that's all I have. Well, thank you.